Well, hello and good morning uh, from different parts of the world. I'm Pranjal Sharma. Uh, at this uh, Oasis Asia meeting, uh, today we're going to be discussing in this session the shaping of New Asia. And joining me in this conversation are going to be Dato Vijay Eshwan, Executive Chairman QI Group Hong Kong, Oki Matsumoto, Chairman Monix Group Japan, and Herbert Chen Wu, Managing Director of the Economist Global Business Review China, and he's joining us from uh, Shanghai. So I'm going to begin by requesting uh, Oki uh, to give us some thoughts. And the idea of this discussion is, is to talk about the fact that it's clearly going to be the Asian century, the economic center of gravity has shifted to Asia. The question is, how do Asian countries come together uh, economically, uh, socially, and, and work to make sure that all the hurdles and implements can be removed and we can accelerate our growth towards our objectives, especially to ensure that our people's uh, get what they want, the development and the better quality of life that all of us aspire for. So, OK, I'd like to, you know, request you to share some of your thoughts and then we'll bring, bring in uh, the other speakers. And I'd like all of you to, you know, just keep adding to each other's thoughts. OK, uh, thank you, Prajal. So I'm OK Matsumoto. I am a CEO uh, of uh, Manex Group. Uh, we are based, uh, headquarters based in Tokyo. Uh, we are running uh, online brokerage business in Japan, in the States, in Hong Kong, in Sydney, in Australia, and a joint venture in uh, in China. And also, we, we uh, operate a large uh, cryptocurrency exchange in Japan. So we operate a business uh, uh, globally. Uh, well, you know, the, as uh, Pranjal said, you know, uh, lots of... Uh, uh, the theme and power and uh, gravity is really shifting to Asia. But uh, together with it, there are lots of uh, kind of secular global change happening, I think. One being that, uh, you know, like uh, the famous ESG, you know, the, the currently, for example, the inflation is happening all over the world. Uh, but it's not only kind of typical inflation, but also driven by the ESG, like uh, the carbon neutrality, and with that uh, energy price going up, or the people's cost going up because of the S of ESG. And these are something that, uh, you know, the uh, traditional monetary policy cannot really deal with. So it's kind of interesting, you know, new you know, change happening uh, driven by ESG. And also there are geopolitical uh, uh, the issue happening as well, uh, you know, uh, you know, for example, like uh, uh, U.S., China, Taiwan, or you know, whatever, you know, something happening, which is uh, quite dif different from uh, like uh, five years ago. So that kind of uh, uh, thing is happening, which again, you know, which is really centered in Asia, but that kind of thing is happening. And also, uh, digital transform transformation is happening as well. You know, CBDC is coming up, uh, led by, uh, you know, uh, lead runner is China, obviously. But the digital trans transformation is happening. And that, you know... Uh, Sorry, uh, just to interrupt you. Chen, there's some disturbance from your side. Can you mute yourself, Chen? Okay, let me... Uh, can I mute? I don't know whether I can mute or not. I think... Uh, you can mute yourself at the bottom of the thing. There is uh, there is some disturbance uh, for me. Thank you. Sorry, okay, please continue. All right. So the digital transfer transformation is happening as well. And uh, that is uh, the big thing. And also, you know, traditionally or historically, you know, Asia has been kind of a very... Uh, somehow naturally, uh, you know, familiar or accustomed to those uh, digital uh, technologies and the CBDC or, 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 or the Web 3.0 or Society 5.0 or whatever we call uh, lots of other digital transformations happening. And that can be or will be uh, is being driven by, you know, a lot uh, from Asia as well. And, uh, you know, the ESG, what I talked at the beginning, lots of population in Asia and lots of, uh, you know, the carbon consumption happening in Asia. So again, ESG 
is also the Asia te uh, uh, takes a very important role, geopolitical issues, digital formation. So in addition to what pa uh, Pranjal said, the you know, growth is shifting to Asia. There are lots, lots happening in Asia. So, uh, so Asia is definitely going to be really to play the very key role in the global, uh, not only economy, but also society. Uh, what I can say is, you know, Japan's been kind of, uh, you know, uh, kind of muted for the last like a decades. Uh, the Japan has got a lots of, uh, you know, the, the environment related technologies, digital technologies, and such and such. So, uh, I hope that the Japan can, uh, come back and play more important role in Asia as well as for the globe. And uh, I really, you know, uh, enjoy, uh, expect that, uh, you're yeah, looking forward to the uh, lots of discussion today on this panel. Thanks, okay. I think you, you've talked about two very critical shifts. Uh, one is ESG and second is digital transformation. ESG, of course, after COP26, there is no question that Asia has to lead the world, but Asia has to do it in a way that it is sustainable for itself. We cannot necessarily take the Western construct and apply it to Asia because that may not work. And, you know, the problems were created by the West. It's not the Asia's responsibility to clean it up uh, all the time. So I think that's a very important view that's also uh, emerging from a, uh, from, from a social and climate point of view. But digital transformation, again, a lot of innovations is happening in Asia for Asia. So I think that's another very important shift that you highlighted. I'd like to come to Chen on this, uh, Chen. Uh, you know, China is, of course, going to be driving a lot on digital transformation, even on climate change. But you see other issues where China can lead Asia uh, or collaborate with Asia uh, to ensure that we work and grow on our own terms. I, I think, you know, just follow up on the previous speakers, there are three additional areas, you know, in, in addition to uh, energy or new uh, climate economy or tra digital transformation. A, of course, is that uh, China is going to be, and I think it's going to continue to be one of the largest market. So as a consumer market, imports from elsewhere will be one of the main drivers for the global economic growth and for regional economic growth. So to what extent China could really try to jumpstart the domestic consumption and also make the imports a bigger driver. So I think that's a very important question. That's a question that we need to pay close attention to. But I think that's very much linked to China's own domestic policy because, you know, I think uh, in the past few months, uh, everyone is concerned about China's real estate uh, market, uh, concerned about uh, big players like uh, Honda and others. So China needs to figure out a best approach to kind of uh, address the problem at, on, at hand and also try to move away of its reliance on the construction and the housing market and really uh, towards more consumption-led market. And that's then the, I think the third driver, that's still kind of mixed because you know China has a pretty good track record in the past, I, I would say, decade to really allow the big tech firms to uh, grow and thrive. But I think currently... Uh, China has just passed the uh, latest uh, law on data protection, which is uh, encouraging, which is, I think, in line with the global trend. But on the other hand, we've also seen some tech clash, which may not bode well in the short term. So I think that's something uh, we need to pay attention to. And also we need to put China into a more uh, global and Asia perspective. So I think the most important thing is geo economics. So Joe, you know, I think the previous speaker has talked about still the, the major challenge facing the global economy is the rivalry between China and the uh, United States. You know, but Biden has come up with this policy, the 3C policy, right? Climate, COVID and China. So to extent US could collaborate and uh, work with China to deal with the differences, to what extent the United States is going to compete with China, I, I think that would have a huge consequence in, in Asia and in, in China, because I think China, uh, there's a great opportunity to try to develop its own 
technology on 5G, on AI, on chips and other things, but it's, it's going to take time and it's going to require collaboration, not within China, but also with Chinese neighbors, South Korea, Japan. So to, to what extent we could come up with a way so that st we could still work to, towards a better goal rather than, you know, uh, other countries following what U.S. has dictated, like boy boycott China. I don't think that's that's going to be a win. Uh, it's going to be a lose lose uh, situation for all of us. So I think I, I I'll just highlight these things. And one final thing is about uh, 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 COP twenty eight, uh, twenty six, and uh, China's uh, uh, emphasis last year on being a summit on twenty thirty and reaching the carbon neutral target on 2060. I think that there's a lot of discussion in China. There's a lot of policy initiatives in China. I think there's a lot of investment opportunities in China, both for Chinese firms and for firms across Asia, because I think the, the Chinese government is really serious about these things. And then there's a lot of opportunities for ranging from uh, electronic cars, batteries to uh, and green cement, green iron, to all the other new energy projects. I'll just stop it. Yeah. So uh, you know, you brought a very good dimension, uh, Chen, on on this issue, which is uh, of geoeconomics, and I think the controversies or or the uh, show of strength between economic giants of the world. Uh, and to fight against each other is really going to have a big impact uh, for the rest of the world, but definitely for Asia. And therefore, all the more reason that Asia uh, figures out a way to grow without its over dependence on the West. Uh, and I think that's really the way ahead in many ways uh, uh, from the perspective that all of you are sharing. Datu, I'd like to bring your thoughts uh, into the picture. Uh, you know, we talked about the importance of digital transformation innovation which is happening for Asia by the Asians, uh, which is a very good development uh, on ESG and climate change. Uh, again, Asia is setting standards for itself. You and the group uh, work across several countries. Uh, and as an Asian giant, I'm sure you have a visibility of where we are headed. Uh, what do you think is going to be the main driver of change for the positive for the near future? You're on mute, Dato. I just did that. Yeah. Thank you, Pranjal. Um, global, the global demographic shifts and economic migrations are creating new opportunities uh, right now, and particularly so in Asia. Uh, Asia will have to balance the need for COVID-related debts while accruing wealth uh, for the state as well as personal investment. Now, how to shape the new Asia? This is going to be a, a real challenge because post pandemic, we are all walking into a new norm. Uh, except for the astrologists, no one seemed to know what really is going to be happening over the next few years. So keeping the predictions aside, we need to know that clearly economies are shifting from the West to the East and the future is going to be the Asian millennium. This is, I think, the writing on the wall. Moving forward, the driving forces in Asia, and this is India, China, ASEAN, where we are from, uh, and also the, the Far East, Japan, Taiwan, and uh, South Korea. So these uh, regional hubs, so to speak, are fundamentally important. If we were to start looking more inward as opposed to looking to build geopolitical uh, relationships with the US, etc., EU, I think if we gave some importance to our backyard, you know, for instance, there, we have uh, two massive economies and um, Asia needs to develop its own uh, philosophy, as you say, Prajal, to deal with the challenges moving forward. Uh, I think what China has done with the Belt and Silk Road Initiative has been actually a very subtle and very powerful move in, you know, bringing together economies across the third world. Now, uh, in, particularly in ASEAN, this has been noticed and uh, not only really noticed, welcomed. The SMEs are the real power of the future. 
It is the SMEs that took the biggest hit during the pandemic. It's the SMEs uh, that are going to rebuild. Uh, no doubt the big boys are important in, in the fashion of, uh, of bringing investment, FDI, so on and so forth, to the various countries across Asia. But we as uh, Asians need to focus on the SMEs because the SMEs, be it in China or in India, are the engines of growth. And they need to basically uh, revive, renew and re-empower themselves. So which leads us to the topic of entrepreneurship. Uh, in the QI group, we are a diversified a multinational entity with a presence, as you say, Punjab across the world. We are pretty much uh, rooted in Asia. Our headquarters is in Hong Kong uh, and um, in Kuala Lumpur, Jakarta, Singapore, etc. We have uh, uh, interests across the whole Asian continent. We started 23 years ago as a, as a business that was purpose-led. A stakeholder capitalism as opposed to, you know, um, the traditional capitalism, and which meant that we need to make a positive impact. We looked at sustainability as our key. We cannot just be profit driven because to us that was too short term. So we developed three powers of uh, three, sorry, three pillars of sustainability, empowering people, transforming, transforming communities and safeguarding the environment. So we have worked uh, relentlessly. Our organization is rooted in these uh, three pillars. Wherever we go, we are involved in one form or another. To come down to the issue of um, what ASEAN is doing, because ASEAN is our backyard. And I think if ASEAN basically, you know, at 650 million people with the fastest growing middle class in the world and the greatest potential to be developed into a powerhouse, and it is basically something that China has actively engaged with. But I do believe that both Japan and India could play bigger roles in ASEAN. Now, ASEAN by itself is clearly not, you know, united and is pretty much diversified and has its own challenges. However, ASEAN has a lot of potential. You know, uh, Indonesia by itself is, you know, uh, a huge market. But when combined together, ASEAN represents uh, a big step towards the future. And using ASEAN's resources, both for China and India, would open up, uh, you know, Asia in, in I think, a significant manner. Clearly, the, the amount of unicorns India has produced over the last year or two, and capital, you know, venture capitalists were, you know, kind of beaten apart to India in the last year or two, would challenge even Silicon Valley. So <laughs> right now, moving forward, we need to take a look at the economic blocks that are being built across the world. Uh, you know, India choosing not to be part of the TPPA and uh, choosing not to be involved in uh, many of these relationships that are being built is something that we also need to look at. Because ultimately, the, the, the giants, India and China, need to engage. And Japan is, of course... Uh, has always been a very powerful force here in Asia. It needs to be brought back to the fore. I totally agree uh, with the gentleman just now, with the speaker just now on that matter. So, in a nutshell. Thanks, Dato. You, you know, you raised, raised a range of uh, uh, issues, but I think the most critical of those are demography, uh, entrepreneurship, and uh, uh, the fact that there has to be uh, you know, we have to look because beyond economic box in, in many ways. But in my view, the most important aspect is ASEAN, as you mentioned. And perhaps ASEAN can be the pivot and can be the center for bringing the rest of Asia together. And the way ASEAN, despite its uh, diversity, has functioned fairly well for so many decades. I think the fact is that unlike other uh, Continents, Asia has the maximum diversity. It has the highest number of young people in the world. You refer to demographics. So therefore, it is important that the Asian philosophy comes together in a more structured format to deliver. Technology can perhaps bring us together and help us overcome a lot of the other barriers. Uh, and and uh, Oki, maybe you would like to talk about that. That you know, uh, while Dato referred to the unicorns coming in India. That's reflecting the fact that companies across health, uh, education, and finance are 
using technology for last mile delivery and that's exactly what uh, you know you have also uh, pioneered now new forms of fintech like cryptocurrency and use of blockchain can actually create a new standard for asia do you think technology can then help asia come together and find solutions for itself i think uh, uh, thank you banjo pranjo i think the one thing we really should not forget is what brought us what brought asia or asean to this stage uh is of course you know, there are many you know the uh, efforts and the initiatives and the many things done in china india and the many places but i think technology or internet played a huge role before the internet you know even there is a you know more population in asia asia was smaller than the us or uk with the internet uh that that brought the you know lot of technologies information intelligence many things to equal to people through the internet so power of cooperation became really big right so we should not forget that technology really helped asia to come this stage so now the people everybody talk about the you know uh, the, uh, the power is shifting to asia the, 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 it's now the asia's period as such and such but if we how do you say if we got uh, satisfied with the current stage then you know uh it's it's not good so we should we should really uh, appreciate what technology or internet or technology has done have done for asia for us and going forward we should really you know uh, even try to uh, make best out of those uh, technologies which is as i said you know web 3.0 or you know the blockchain and the trusted internet uh, those kind of things um so that that is really the key for the the more growth for the asia going forward and in in that in that in that aspect you know the china india japan singapore you know they really playing a very important role and uh, the digital world uh uh you know uh, uh naturally it's really global so uh we should somehow really work together to make sure that we really benefit from uh, this new technologies for asia i think that is the uh, most important thing for us thanks okay but you know chen i'm going to come to you and ask a question in fact for all of you i think technology is can be unified but you know it's also becoming a place where uh, people are competing and you know the tech wars are becoming more important than uh, anything else so the supremacy uh, of a country is now defined not just by the value of their currency or their economic strength but really by what kind of technology they have chen in that front on that front i think china is leaving the world far behind and people are getting also scared about it so i think there are two aspects of uh, you know technology leadership or competition for the latest technology. a of course is what we envision what the world will be like so blockchain or the what, what, what's in fashion today is metaverse right so it's very much in fashion china everyone wanted to understand whether that's the next uh, generation of mobile internet and if that is what kind of uh, new uh, business models and new ways of engagement could be so that's the kind of a vision but on the other hand there's also practices so i think there's a concern of course that uh, china is become its own ecosystem it's uh, very much different from rest of the world and what does that mean to asia and to global so that, that's number one number two of course i think china has been uh, moving very rapidly on two very important fronts a of course is the collection and use of uh, the behavior data and then to build algorithms that would train uh, you know very powerful engines so that they could provide better services better you know new new ways of engagement so that's an area that's really interesting 
But of course, on the other hand, there's also a concern about data privacy, about surveillance, and about uh, what will be the kind of a next generation of rules and regulations that we need to come into play to make sure that individuals are not being kind of pushed into this metaverse without any protection. So I think China could be seen as a very interesting experiment, and what came out of China could have some lessons that other countries could learn. And the third thing is, you know, 10 years ago, we came up with a suggestion saying that frugal innovation. So I think China is a pioneer in frugal innovation. So one example we use is that GE, before entering China, uh, some of the uh, medical equipment could cost to uh, 10, 20,000 dollars piece. In China, once they come up with it in China, for China uh, policy, they could reduce that price to a thousand dollars. That's much, much cheaper. Almost 80 percent of functionality, you know, 10 times low, uh, lower in terms of price. So I think that's something that Chinese market, because it's, it's a huge market, it's a scalable market. So there's a lot of interesting solutions, both coming from MNCs and also coming from Chinese dom exit firms that could be applied elsewhere so that the frugal innovation would help the uh, emerging middle class of ASEAN and Indian people to really benefit. You don't need to take up uh, more expensive solutions. China could offer something that's more affordable but still help everyone to raise their living standards. And I think that requires more collaboration because I think you know every country, to a certain extent, would want to have some kind of an investment from Chinese uh, tech giants or kind of a collaboration between, uh, among Chinese tech giants so that they could come up with more localized solutions. So global and local, how do we make it a global, a kind of global solution that's really catering to the needs of billions of people in Asia and in, in India? And one last thing I want to emphasize, I say I agree with, with uh, Vijay on, on the importance of China and India to really try to work out a more collaborative relationship. Uh, it's, you know, both are huge markets. Both are places with huge amount of talents. And China, compared to India, we have one thing that India has that China no longer have, that's uh, the population dividend, right? So China is aging rapidly. China needs to actually follow uh, and learn from Japan to say, how do we deal with a population that's aging and the population that's not giving birth to young ba uh, little babies. So I think China is also in transition. So in a way, how could the two giants work together so that we can be the two important pillars for Asia? I think that's a, a billion dollar, trillion dollar question for us uh, for this decade. That's a great point, Jen. I think that's, that's something I think industry should uh, also uh, work with the governments to bring it together. But Dato, the, the point of innovation and innovating for, uh, you know, global and local, I think those PEMs have come across from what Oki said, what Chen said, and you referred to it. Can you share some good examples maybe within your group of where innovations have been done for Asia, for the Asian needs? And, you know, all the technological, you know, much of the technological innovations that we use were developed in the West, but now it's shifting to, to what is being created in, in Asia. So are there some thoughts and ideas you have or examples from your group that you would like to talk about? Well, first of all, I'd like to point out that uh, with due regard or respect to the technological improvements that has uh, happened worldwide, powering it behind is the also the entrepreneurship that has really grown in leaps and bounds. You know, of course, uh, in that sense of the word, Asia has a natural advantage well over the rest of the planet, so to speak. You know, and Asia has always had that because of the fact that uh, Asia has been in the uh, in the trade routes between the east and west. Uh, moving forward, in my opinion. Uh, we have, um, in essence, we have to recognize that Asia is going to be leading or at least taking up, you know, half of the world's GDP by 2040. And uh, this has been a fast and um, uh, reasonably fast and, you know, critically important development. Uh, in terms of um, ASEAN, 
ASEAN has always been focused on building entrepreneurship, primarily rural entrepreneurship, in uh, due to job scarcity that has now evolved. ASEAN is also, like India, uh, has a young, burgeoning young workforce. And uh, both of these are circumstances that need to be leveraged upon. Frugal innovation is, however, also common to both India and China. India, too, has been very focused on frugal innovation. One must not forget. The point, though, is for both India and China, China has been looking outward, clearly, for the, for the longest time, as the, uh, uh, the Silk and Belt Road Initiative has shown. India needs to look, you know, uh, to developing its own backyard. And its own backyard is ASEAN, for, for example, and, uh, you know, not taking full advantage of this because of the... Uh, China is part a diaspora in ASEAN. And this diaspora is a natural influx of, of you know, Chinese ideas and, and connections and networking between the mainland and ASEAN. India has also equally a diaspora. And it needs to be leveraged upon. It needs to be developed. India, if the borders actually come down uh, and... Um, as you know, we start looking outward as opposed to inward, then the possibilities of cross-border entrepreneurship will happen. And this is so critically important because it is entrepreneurship that's going to drive the markets. If you take a look at the TEAs, which is basically, you know, uh, entrepreneurs who began within the last 12 months, you know, Asia is well ahead of the rest of the world. We are about the one place where there is a positive growth of entrepreneurs, particularly using the internet. The online entrepreneurship has taken on a life of its own. It has shaped all of our lives in many ways. We are having things delivered to our doorstep that was not possible, you know, prior to the pandemic. And today it's happening in a burgeoning scale. And both India and China have this leverage and advantage. And ASEAN is a, a great place, uh, a factory, if you like, a global factory that can be utilized whereby these three, you know, regions could uh, basically pull Asia to the front. And this needs to happen. I think basically it needs to have inclusive business models that are built. And if we brought down the borders in between, you know, our, our current borders, I mean, it may be a lot more easier to bring in EU goods into Asia than, say, Indian and Chinese goods, you know, as sad as it may seem. So, you know, uh, it's ridiculous that we are allowing American or EU goods to be, you know, coming into these markets as opposed to us being able to build uh, our cross-border relationships. And we need to be completely more inclusive in this regard. So um, it's about policymakers needing to involve business stakeholders from the start and being open to sustainability. You know, uh, we have to look at sustainable, you know, business interests. And uh, business in India should lead the sustainability movement. This has always been my feeling on this matter. Thanks, Adho. I think uh, the point on ASEAN is very well taken and uh, on entrepreneurship. And okay, that's the question I would like to pose for you to build on what Dato said. Is, uh, you know, there was also a while when, when Japan used to look at investing mostly in the Western markets. But I noticed that in recent years, there's been a very strong uh, policy to look at investment opportunities uh, in uh, in the rest of Asia as well. And that's, of course, triggering, you know, capital funds entrepreneurship. Uh, do you see China, China and Japan who are also looking at, at investing within Asia? Do you see that making a big, uh, you know, shift or a big impact on entrepreneurship, the amount of funds which are coming through? Well, I think the... Uh of course, the uh, the financial support of fund is very important to foster the entrepreneurship. But I think the education is uh, even more important. And the reason why, you know, in Japan or you know, in, in many parts of the Asia, you know, lots of uh, entrepreneurial, you know, startups and all kinds of things happening. I think. The, the most important driver for that is the, the education. And uh, education in the, the, the local, lo, local nations, or people around in, in the States, or people around many things through the internet. 
or through books, through YouTube, or through podcasts or whatever. So that kind of uh, educational process really uh, been fostering the uh, entrepreneurship, you know, not only in Asia, but also o- over the world. And so um, uh, you're right, you know, fund is important. But, uh, you know, I, I've been, I, I tend to be asked by the government of Japan about a uh, kind of similar question, how best we, uh, the Japan can foster or encourage more entrepreneurship. And they tend to ask more fund. Should government support more, you know, financially support the startups? And I tend to say, please don't. You know, at the end of the day, you know, the, the government is actually most, uh, how do you say, uh, they have uh, the least understanding of the risk return of investment. So please don't. And I said, you know, you should spend, if you want to spend money, you should spend money on creating a more, how do you say, engineering courses in universities in Japan or blah, blah, blah. So I think education is really the key. And I think that is the same case for the entire Asia as well. You know, if you, I don't know about the China very well, but, uh, you know, the many parts of the Asia, uh, the, the nations should really think about the providing more education, engineering, and those kind of education to young people. And that is going to be very important for, for us more than fund support, I think. Thank you. So, you know, we have less than 10 minutes left. So I'll, I'll, on this point, I'll quickly request, uh, uh, you know, uh, the others. I think there is a request uh, from uh, George Wang to ask a question. Um, George, you have the mic. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, we well, the other panel. I have a question. You know, we uh, we are in the business doing uh, uh, contract manufacturing. Uh, we have our company have operations in China, India, Nam, Thailand, many Singapore, Malaysia, many different places. So right now, the world is really in a bad shape. However, all the geopolitics have set the world in deeper and deeper trouble. What, what do you think of the next two, three years in Asia with all these politics going on? The p- people are suffering. The politicians, they are not looking at it. They are all have their whatever agenda, right? Yeah, that's right, George. So, you know, that's a good point. I think we just have time for one quick answer on this because we have to end now. Uh, would any of you like to take this? Uh, Oki, Chen or Dato? Geopolitics will take its own turn. I mean, if we waited for geopolitics to sort itself out, we will still be waiting. The issue here is for us to go past it, you know, just as the world of uh, entrepreneurship today is about working our way around geopolitics. What's really happened is that the workforce by 2025 will be 75% millennials and Gen Z. They don't need any kind of education or introduction towards the world of the internet. They grew up with it. They have a total uh, a, a different opinion on how things should work and, and the products and services they need. So the best way for us to move forward is to make sure that our own workforce is about 75% millennial before then. Because then you have a, a cross-border, a cross-geopolitic you know, communication happening. Because these people actually have a different viewpoint of the planet in, in COP26. And they're very aggressive about what they want to see. And the brick and mortar education is not what they're seeking these days. They want to get into uh, you know, getting things done uh, as soon as possible. Perhaps one key towards all of this is involving them more in the in the future aspirations of your company right thank you i see our uh, speaker uh, neeraj has just joined neeraj we have actually only five minutes left but since you've just joined in i'll request you to share your thoughts for a couple of minutes on uh, you know we're talking about what is going to help asia asian century realize its potential uh, since you are uh, from the stock exchange i believe you would uh, like to share a few thoughts on on whether the financial services sector can bring Asia together and we can set our own 
uh, terms for growth from here on. So, uh, you know, about three or four minutes, if you could share, and then we'll have to end. Yeah, sure, sure. I'm, my apologies because I I just had a major problem through my office security protocols. So, apologies. Please. Yeah. So, uh, see, our perspective is that uh, with the shift towards Asia, I mean, it, it's it's happening, and uh, with two, uh, at least with with the with China, and hopefully, India playing catch up. Okay, we will reach there. And one of the uh, major level levelers of, uh, I mean, if we can really call it, is technology. Because uh, technology and digitization, that's one. The second is with a large population that we have. Uh, there would be significant, uh, I mean, as was being referred to earlier about millennials. You know, these are important factors, and uh, aspirational countries. So. The, you know, prospectively, an aspirational country like India, where there is this urge to grow amongst people with all the challenges that they have, that would be transformational. And yes, the government uh, support would be required for a long, long time. I mean, that's the way it is. But uh, one of the other aspects is that with the financial markets that we re- that I represent. Uh, that has also grown because gradually uh, the su- from the support from the government with respect to supporting industry has to come down and the markets have to take over and that's what we are seeing in terms of the recent uh, developments in the country in terms of the huge rise in markets that's taking place and a lo- lot of the market rise is also being contributed to by the millennials so net net uh, understanding the perspective that uh, there is a shift towards Asia. Uh, there would be, uh, and we would have our challenges. Uh, we uh, we will continue to work with uh, various countries, including China and various other aspects, but gradually we'll reach somewhere because we understand that we have to all work together. So we'll work together on international forums, on various other initiatives. and But we would, but with the growth in technology for example that's been a big, huge leveler for india i mean that's been that's really helped us uh, reach a particular stage and i'm sure uh, the next stage uh, with we would be able to contribute much more i mean as you can be seen in the recent initiatives relating to covid for example or vaccinations how india became a significant provider of that so we continue to support global initiatives i mean see we have been like that just that we are we have our own realities to face in our neighborhood which uh, I'm sure uh, that's that's part of geopolitics, which would continue. Sure. So I end here. I end thank you, Neeraj. Right. And, you know, I'll, we have to end now because we have less than a minute left. And I'd like to thank all the participants and the speakers, uh, Dato, Chen, uh, Oki, and Neeraj. I would, I would sum up by saying that the, from all of you, the four uh, uh, E's that I have discovered are, are where Asia must collaborate and develop its own approach which is already happening, but it has to come across more strong, is on ecology, education, economy, and entrepreneurship. And I think only these four pillars uh, are where uh, the new Asian century and a collaborative growth can be built on. So thank you once again for joining us uh, for this session on the new Asia. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.